Cancer Council New South Wales acknowledges the traditional custodians, both past and present, of the lands on which we live and work. Hello and welcome, my name is Jill Mills and tonight we will be talking about how we can support people after cancer treatment. So um, first some housekeeping, so if you have any technical problems, um, the 1800 number that's on your screen there, 1800 733 416, Call that number and the technical support will help you. Um, so we'd like to hear from you in the chat box tonight. Uh, feel free to chat to each other, ask questions. We're open to any new questions that may come up and to, to discuss. So put them in there. If you get a bit distracted by the chat, it's not a problem. You can watch the recording later. Um, and it's being recorded, so yeah, watch it later please. So if at any stage you feel that you need to speak to somebody um, urgently, if there's anything that comes up for you, you can ring a Lifeline counsellor on 13 11 14 and that's available 24 hours a day. So let's get started. So I'd like to introduce our panel here tonight. So we have on the end Professor Sanchi Aranda from Cancer Council Australia. Next to me is Sam, Brett and Yvonne who we're going to open with and are going to talk about their stories and their experiences and what the things that they would have liked people to assist them with after they finish their cancer treatment. So we'll hand over to you, Sam. Alrighty. So we'll flick through to that next slide. Through. Hold on. So um, my story, I guess, I was, I was diagnosed at the age of 21 in October of 2011 with um, stage 3B Hodgkin's lymphoma. I went through probably about eight months of, um, of diagnostics before they found what cancer I had. So lumbar punctures, lots of CTs, and a lot of like pretty bad stuff. And then finally had um, a chemotherapy regimen called Escalated Beacop, or Beacop 14, and I've been clear since February of 2012. So diagnosed 21, cleared. 22 and it's nearly been five years as of the 23rd of December of this year It'll be five years since I've been clean which is technically cured with Hodgkin's and um, Yeah, so it was a pretty rough ride, but that's about it um, My uh, my journey so to speak was on RPA the television show So I got to not only go through the amazing amazing experience of his surgery and chemotherapy But um, I got to watch it all after it all happened and I can still re-watch it if I'd like but it's not really for me. Um, so that was me when I chose to shave my hair before I started chemotherapy. Um, that's my tumour getting taken out for a biopsy, which is you know reasonably interesting and something people, something that most people don't really get to see. Um, after that, some <laughs> hospital cookies a friend of mine made for me while I was in hospital, which is ridiculously important. Um, I guess like the most important thing after all of this is just to like have a bit of a sense of humour, and that's what got me through the whole thing in the end. Yeah. That was short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, Sam. My so we're pleasure. Gonna, we're going to hand over to Brett now. So Sam's going to click the slides for you, Brett. Alrighty. So My over to Brett. you. No, I was diagnosed on the 6th of December 1988, which was coincidentally the same night as my year 10 graduation. That threw a whole banner into the works, but uh, I was diagnosed with a couple of brain tumours and the Fancy name is germ cell pinnigloma. I like to do a bit of bragging, but the odds that I got of that cancer was apparently 3 million to 1 to get it and 10 million to 1 to kick its bum, so I'm not going to win the lottery. This, um, that's me at my prime. I think I was about 32 kilos there, and my mum was holding me up, I couldn't stand up on my own. And, um, I was laid, pretty much laying in a hospital bed for uh, five months with the treatment. And they had to stop the treatment because uh, they were, either would have died or starved to death. Or, so at that stage, the tumours were gone. And uh, uh, they, they expected a relapse, which I, which I did. But what kept me alive, my inspiration to get alive, was to get back out for a surf. And cause that was my goal, to get back out and ride a wave again. And sure enough, I finally got there. And the first way, well, the first time I went out, I couldn't. Um, by the time I got wetsuit on, I was too stuffed to paddle out to get out the back. And the second time, I finally got out there and too stuffed to catch a wave. But the third time, I got that wave. 
My mates cheered, I cried. It was all worthwhile. And um, due to side effects or damage done, I do have a few side effects. And this one was, I suppose, I was a member of Canteen. You probably might have heard of Canteen. And through my work, what I've done through Canteen and um, work outside of Canteen and voluntary sort of things, my sister done really uh, nominated me to or nominated me to run with a limp torch in this another moment of glory for Brett. That was around the central business district of Terrigal on the central coast. And I, with the dramas that I do have these days, I don't like to think that I suffer from them, I live with them. And though I can't do this and that that I used to be able to do, I can do other things which I found new abilities such as writing. Um, I don't know what else to um, say. You guys are writing there, but my biggest battle hasn't been the overcoming cancer, but from what's gone on from there. So just trying to get back to life like we all have and um, finding a proper job. And because I didn't get to do my HSC, that sort of threw that out the door as well. So a lot of my experience. Um, future plans were sort of thrown out the door, and I sort of had to pick up what I got left and do what I can with it. And so, the way I look at my life, all I can ask myself is to be the best I can be. Yeah. Is that okay? Great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to hand over to Yvonne now. Yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Yvonne. <coughs> Thank and you. Thank you, Brett. That was, was good. So, I probably yeah. didn't blunder too much, but anyway. That's all right. We'll, we'll talk more. Okay. So, yeah. So hi everyone, I'm Yvonne and like Brett and Sam, I'm talking to you from a patient perspective. Um, I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2011 when I was 37 and I was thinking um, the last few days about what we're going to talk about, about how to support somebody who is finished their, their treatment for cancer and I kept coming back to the idea that to be supportive for someone who's finished you really need to understand who they are now because the person going into treatment could be very different from the person coming out of treatment and we were talking about that just earlier and that's okay because life life changes us um, other curveballs get thrown at you and and people you know do do change I mean that's just human nature but to be that support for the person who's finished you really do need to understand who they are now so when I, when I sort of talk about my journey, I was going to do it in that same format of before and after, just so you can sort of see maybe some of the differences. So the first, the first slide that will eventually get up there is a picture of who I was before everything happened. So I'd, I'd just got married. Uh, the picture when it comes up is a picture on my honeymoon. And we were, it was me and my lovely husband in a vineyard in New Zealand, so all was good. Um, and it was just a normal life. I didn't have any family history of breast cancer. I didn't have any indications, but one day there was, there was a lump. So, so everything changed that day. So this so is this, the this was my before picture. This was my honeymoon. And I think I've pretty much said everything I wanted to say about that. Uh, this, okay, so, so this is my during picture. Um, there, are, there aren't a lot of pictures of me during treatment because, believe it or not, I wasn't at my most photogenic. Um, and I'll just point out that the grey hair was a lovely surprise. I, uh, of course. Finally grew back and it was old lady grey, but we won't talk about that right now. Um, I was really happy here. I'm holding balloons that my nurses gave me because I just finished radiation. So this was following, I had surgery first and then I had, I had eight, uh, 16 rounds of chemo. So I had a lot of surgery, a lot of chemo, then I had a lot of radiation. And I got to ring the bell and I got to do my little happy dance that I was finished. But, but it's not finished and I, I put this picture here because it's a really big misconception that once you've finished your active treatment, you're done and you move on and, and it's, all, it's game over. But, it, but it's not. So... Um, Regardless of whether you have other treatments, I had Herceptin, I had hormone therapy, and I, I'm still on Tamoxifen. But regardless of whether you've got that um, ahead of you, or if it's just living with some of the physical changes or the emotional changes, it's, it, the point that I'm making in <laughs> a very long way is that it's not over. Um, you know, it, you're not finished when they say that you're finished when you walk out of the hospital for the last time. 
So, uh, yeah. so this is this is my after pics. Um, this is another significant man in my life. This is my hairdresser. This is this is Nathan. Nathan's actually been with me for the whole journey because he used to do my hair before. Then he did my pre chemo haircut, and then he sorted out that grey mess that came back. And and so now we have a little celebration and a little a salon selfie. Hashtag salon selfie after every time I go to the hairdresser. And I haven't put this in to be flippant because it's it's not about the hair. It's it's really just to let you know that actually you do get back to doing normal stuff to have, being yourself even if yourself's a little bit blonder than they were before. Um, but, but you do get back to doing your normal stuff, even if there are differences. The, di the differences, you know, it's very easy to sort of think that they're all going to be bad, but they're all, in my case, that they're manageable. You learn to deal with the anxieties or the physical problems. You, you just have to learn how to deal with them and, and, and move on. And if you can't, then you need to access some support because there's lots of support out there. Um, but you do get back to being your, your normal. Um, and so I've just also just put in a little slide um, about what I did next. So I actually wrote a book called One Piece of Advice that some of you might have seen. And it's a collection of practical help, hints and tips that I gathered along the way. Um, people, people you meet you know, in, the, in the day centre will have little tips that might help you and I collected them to help the next lot of people going through treatment but also because there was this just wonderful wealth of information out there and really generous people who were giving it and I wanted to sort of capture it so people could have all of that. Um, and so when I talk to people, I usually talk to people about um, how to support someone who's going through treatment so I'm actually, it's really exciting that we can now have the next chapter and talk about supporting somebody through survivorship. Which is what we're going to talk about more talk tonight. About. Yes. And is it almost like the hairdressers want to be part of your support network? My hairdresser. Apart from you've got to really pay him, probably. <laughs> my, hair, my hairdresser is a, a truly beautiful man. And, you know, when I had that pre chemo haircut, he, he gave me his personal mobile and said, when it starts to fall out, I will come over and I will just tide it yeah, up for no, you. Yeah, it's really lovely. Like, he's just a beautiful man. Mm. Mm. And, and I'm sure, you know, lots of people have that relationship because. You know, it is more than just hair. The hair thing's hard. Yeah, like I, as I said earlier, like I took control of it and just got my mate to shave it off as soon as I knew I was going into chemo because it's just, you've got to take what little control that you can at the beginning, I think. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's hard because a so lot of the... it's not just a female thing? No, no, not at all. No, you know? but it's also very, you know, it's very visual. Going through cancer treatment is, is very visual. And I guess Most one of the survivorship definitely. things is, you know, you, d you do look different afterwards. And that might be, you know, you guys both lost a lot of weight. I gained a lot of weight from the medication. And that's not always going to go away. And some of the medication that you're still on keeps the weight on. So that's mm. just, you know, it doesn't sound like a little thing, you know, a big thing I put on weight. But when you've got all these other visual reminders and visual, visual things, it actually does become quite important. Mm. Most definitely. My hair thinned out or has thinned out since treatment. Um, it's fine, it's still there. I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. But yeah, it was completely different when it came back. Yeah. Mm. Well, I've been bald myself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, the dents and scars on my head, bald getting a shot. And like about the view, the hair comes back a different colour. Yeah. I used to be really blonde, like, um, blonde there, and then um, come back like a, my brother used to call it a grey kangaroo skin colour. And then it went uh, dark and orange. And used to be blonde again, and then now it's gone dark again. Mm. There you go. Because like, it's good, you didn't have to bother washing your hair or something. <laughs> <laughs> that makes life easier. Silver lining. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Yvonne. So, um, Sanchia, I, and I admitted to say you're the CEO of Cancer Council Australia, so we have to get that straight for everybody. So would you like to talk a little bit, following on from the subject, obviously, and the things that everyone's just been saying? Um, yeah. yeah. Sure, I guess one of the things I'd like to pick up on is the idea that... Uh, you have to have been part of the journey at some level to be able to be a great support afterwards. And I, but I, often people who are around a person experiencing cancer don't know what to say. They don't know how to be part of that journey. They worry that they're going to stay, say the wrong thing. And I think one of the things I've picked up from what, what Yvonne's talking about is that if you actually ask how people are going um, and offer uh, a way of giving help so how would it be most helpful to you what what is it that I can engage with you to talk about your story rather than 
I think a piece of advice is, is an interesting concept because one of the things that patients have often told me, um, I'm a nurse by background, is that they get a whole lot of advice that's not actually that helpful. <laughs> um, uh, my niece is uh, experiencing cancer at the moment and you know, everyone's got the bit of advice about what she can do to make sure she survives it. Uh, but it's the people who actually want to be part of her journey, keep treating her as if she's a normal human being, uh, want to be um, able to support her, but also to tell her about the things that are happening in, in normal life that are the ones that are going to be there with her through mm. over time. Yeah, I think I think I was touching before upon how um, you need to know who the person is now. I think you also need to really recognise your relationship to that person. Mm -hmm. So if you've been best friends for twenty years and you tell each other everything, then you know you're being supportive by just having that relationship. And yeah. I don't think anything's off the table unless the person says it is. But often you get people, you know, it might be an acquaintance, but they feel like they need to swoop in and ask questions and sort of maybe be a hero and help them out or maybe just, you know, ask questions that aren't appropriate for that relationship. Everybody has a story about their relative or their other person yeah. who got cancer or have you tried this treatment or this and it's just like, this isn't helpful. Enough of the horror stories yeah, yeah, it's as like, well. Oh yeah, my auntie had that, she died. Cheers. Uh, yeah, it's um, it, everybody becomes a professional. But it can be a bit scary sometimes, yeah. and you know, really um, really interferes with your mindset, I suppose. We get a lot of horror stories. We yeah. get a lot of people telling us about the case when it didn't work out, and I, I know why they're doing it. They hear cancer, and they try and relate to you by bringing up their cancer story. Mm. Mm. But that's that's not helpful. That at all. that never helped once. Also, phony, you know, phony treatments as well. I got that a little bit as well because you know my age group as well. There's a lot of kind of like, I guess, new agey ideas. Um, and it can, a lot of that stuff is, you know, misinformation is quite dangerous as well. And, you know, scared people are, you know, they're looking for answers. And it's yeah. in Western medicine, it's not in, you know, um, vitamins and minerals, so to speak. So I got a lot of that. I don't know if you guys experienced that at all, but alternative therapies that would probably leave me dead, that was pretty terrifying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. you've got to be careful of all that. Yeah. So I think, and then going on to the next phase, when you finish your treatment and how different you are and, you know, the way your family or friends, as you were saying, Yvonne, the things that, that you've experienced. What about you, Sam, with being young, lot, so much younger and, I, think I don't know, were you at uni? Did you start I, uni I was, at that I time? was. It, um, I had to, so I'm just now finishing my undergraduate degree. So I was studying and then got sick, had to leave and then came back and had to kind of relearn everything and just, you know, had the terrifying aspect of doing, of completing my tertiary education and like just functioning, which I found very, very hard for the first year. And I guarantee you that all of my family and friends to this day are probably tired of hearing me say how tired I am. That's my big difference is fatigue. And that's kind of the main thing I struggle with now. And anybody I have a really close relationship has to understand that like when I can't do something for whatever reason because I'm fatigued, I actually mean like more than a normal person. It's kind of like, yeah, I guess, that's, that's something that's, I've struggled with, just being my general levels of energy have been ridiculously low. And this is, you know, this is going on four years, and it has to do with my lifestyle as well, but I really think you know, chemotherapy and the entire cancer experience certainly has affected that, and to this day it remains as such. Mm. Yeah. And you think your close friends understand that? Yeah, they do. The good ones do. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, my girlfriend's sick of hearing it. My, my, um, my folks definitely are. My friends are too, but they do understand. You know, I get a cop a lot from them, but it's... Yeah, there's a, there's a great amount of understanding there and everybody gives me a bit of extra space and time if I need it, which you often do, you yes. know, even, again, even four years on. So, Sam, did yeah. you meet your girlfriend after or before? Because um, no. the whole issue of disclosing after, your... After, mm. yeah. So I did have a partner throughout the entire experience. We actually had a pretty big falling out after it and I'm pretty sure her going through chemotherapy with me at such a young age had quite a bit to do with us kind of eventually falling apart. But um, no, no, I met my current girlfriend like in the last couple of years, so quite a long way after. But she knows about everything and, you know. When did you choose to disclose? Because often mm. people, particularly if you're thinking about uh, a work environment or re uh, getting a new job, when is it that you say that? Should you talk about your previous experiences? With I tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is so, a good one. I'm, yeah, very, yeah. I'm very proud of yeah. my um, <laughs> achievement as well, mate, so I appreciate yeah, hearing that go. too. You know, and I'm on all the cancer council stuff, so it's like my mates often call me up and say, "Hey, mate, saw your ad today." <laughs> yeah. You know, and so it's kind of hard not to say anything, really. Yeah. 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 What about you, Brett? With with the work 
we're talking about work and you know do you when you're going for a job do you tell people i find um as i was saying you know I always, the people if the application asks what do you consider your greatest achievement i always regardless whether it's good or bad put overcoming cancer yeah i'm unsure whether that's detrimental to the application or whether it shows the um determination i've got to drive and just to succeed yeah and aside from um, a few medical issues, because uh, I didn't complete my HSC, I didn't get on to the, um, I don't have to carry the same status as an HSC or a uni degree. I've done quite a few TAFE courses that haven't gone anywhere, which is often very mm. frustrating. Mm. Mm. And physically, I'm a carpenter by trade, you know, um, bartender, clerk, and my latest uh, job has been teacher's aide. I've um, forgotten where I'm getting that now. Oh, the um, last course I did was an O10 course in communication and media, and that was online. And I thought I'd done well with the teacher's aide course, but that little glitch just big well name still sent Well done. <laughs> I actually got distinctions and all, so I was really stoked really with good. that. But like I was saying, a TAFE degree is nothing compared to uni degrees and all the jobs that I've applied for have been, they wanted uni degrees. Mm. So, yeah. so it seems sometimes, what's the point? I don't know, that's not the right attitude. Mm. But, um, but you don't hide the fact you've had cancer. I no, think, that's, is, I was talking yeah. to the, yeah. um, I've been getting some support from the Deaf Society. I told them that I always put that in, I said sometimes, depending on the situation, it's whether you should throw it in or not, but I also have a casual case of epilepsy. No, I don't sort of, I don't put that in the resume. But if I don't divulge my past medical experiences, um, or if I get an in, into an interview, I do let them know that just because basically safety reasons. And, mm -hmm. um, but it's been, the, I think the major hurdle was not having the HSC to start with, because this was a long time ago, so that didn't seem to go anywhere. Mm. And as I said, I've been trying to go for disability pension for years, because I don't feel, see myself as being disa disabled enough to be on it. Mm -hmm. And so thank you taxpayers for helping me out. And so I've just got to keep trying. So who, who are the people you've got around supporting you, and how, what, kind of, what does support look like for you from those people? Well, my family are un unbelievable. They're the greatest support. I've always said well enough here, the greatest support that I have. We've got, we have got tissues. <laughs> <laughs> wet ones in here already. But, uh, um, I found lately, uh, my mates were great support while I was going through treatment, but now they're all sort of married and children. I don't hear from many very often anymore. Mm. That's just really hit hard in recent times. Um, but my greatest support has been my family, and we've heard of Canteen. Mm. They were brilliant as well. And uh, if I hadn't been through Canteen, I more than likely wouldn't have done some of the things I've done since, mm. or met some of the great people I have. Yeah. And I was very lucky as well because I was in, in hospital pretty much the same, or five, for the five months with the same number of blokes. That was at RPA, and we supported each other as well. Often had quite a few laughs and um, shed a few tears, but we all sort of bonded together so well. That's when you were 15. I was 15. Yeah. And another bloke was 18, and um, yeah. a couple of older blokes. It was a variety of ages, and we come from all around Australia. So, and I've, um, in regards to support, we're still in support, aren't we? And I've, um, I like to think sometimes I give myself a blast when I need it. Just um, like, well done, Brett, you've done that. Or surprise somebody, well done yeah. again. <laughs> so you've got yeah. a good positive attitude. And that's the thing. And, um, I'm very fortunate. I have an op optimistic attitude. I might be get, getting down, then I'll see a nice blue sky or catch a wave and it'll lift me back up again. Yeah, that's good. Then something will kick me in the bum and then I'll wave it off and start again. That's good. Right on. So we might go into some of the questions. 
that we've got up there. Um, so the first question, what one thing would someone who has survived cancer like me to know? So it's kind of, it's as it was written. So if there was one thing... Don't tell me I look tired. I know I look yeah. tired. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, come in, man, you look like hell. That, that sucks. That was <laughs> like a really big thing for me. Like I used to tell my friends, don't, I know, like, don't, don't say that. It's hard. Um, so they yeah. stopped saying that? Yeah, they did. They did. Like, I know I how tired I look. I had to look in the mirror every goddamn day. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, that would be my one thing. Don't tell me I look tired. Yeah. It's not a death, always a death sentence. Um, and as just to say, the after effects, Amy, that maybe that's only recently I've come to accept the things I can and can't do. So, look, well, roll what we've got with the, at the end of it. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. It's probably not much, but anyway. That's all right. That's good. Um, I think the one thing I would like people to be aware of is is that anxiety can can come after treatment or during treatment or at any point, and I think it's important to be aware of it because we often get talked to about fear of recurrence, and fear of recurrence is exactly what it is. It's um, it's fear of the cancer coming back and it's very common but it's very nasty <laughs> and it can be really overwhelming but aside from the fear of recurrence you can also get more of a generalised anxiety just from what you've been through and I think it's important to sort of understand or, or look into what some of the signs might be so you can get some help because there's lots of help out there and it really doesn't have to be it can come in waves and be very overwhelming, but it doesn't have to be like that all the time. But I think if you're focused on moving forward and ignoring some of these little niggly things, like you feel a bit uneasy or a bit panicky, I think you're heading for trouble if you ignore it. So even though mm. you want to sort of be moving that way, you might need to sort of stop for a little while, reassess, see how you are and, and reach out if you need to. Most definitely. Mm. So personally, I, I have had anxiety. Um, and when I saw a doctor about it, he, you know, his opinion was this was always going to come. So I think it's important to recognise that, you know, you might have good days and bad days, but, you know, you also might be sort of heading towards something that you need to, to manage a little yeah. bit more efficiently. I think it's a matter with anxiety as well of... Um, when not if like i i don't think i've met anybody who's been through like a cancer journey or experience who hasn't who doesn't still have you know if they survived or whatever um who doesn't still have some type of health related anxiety or just a bit of a you know mild anxiety disorder in general it comes with the territory you know you face your own mortality it's terrifying it is terrifying yeah. and 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 you know if you're watching this and you're in the like in the middle of treatment it's not always as mm. raw and and scary as it is at mm. the beginning because you're just dealing with it, getting up it isn't it isn't Truly, it isn't always that bad. But if you, you know, if you are looking at this about how to support people, if you're looking at supporting people further down the line as well, it's important when you, under, as I said before, when you're understanding who, what your friend is like, you need to understand what the triggers are. And I think health-related anxiety. So if there's a scan coming up, or if you've, you're seeing someone for your annual check or mammogram or whatever it is that time can be really anxious and, and it's very easy if you haven't experienced cancer to go, oh yeah, that's natural, that's normal, I'm sure everyone's nervous, but you're, you're reliving what was probably the worst time of your life and, and you're reliving it and you're reliving it and, and it can be a really... It can, the lead up to, to scan day can be... Oh, yeah, know, Vietnam flashbacks, it's terrifying. It can, be, yeah. it can be really, really overwhelming. So I think if, you know, if you've got a friend who's survived cancer and they're a close friend and you know when the scan's coming up, you can you know, step in and make their week before a bit easier. Mm. You know, just, just them knowing that you, you know, you're feeling like this. I know when my friends are aware of how I'm feeling. It makes things easier for me because I don't have to then worry that I'm acting weird around people. Mm. I think one of the questions was over there is um, what what are some of the things that you can do? So so mm. certainly seeking help is important and knowing something about the triggers. So you've yeah. talked about scans. For some people it's actually night times um, or being alone and um, being able to seek some help so that you can develop some fairly simple skills. Some For some people it's just deep breathing exercises and being able to focus others use things like meditation, others use outdoor activities or gardening mm. or, you know, something mm. that can actually um, be the things that you can do when you've got those triggers. So it is certainly worth seeking help. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. cognitive behavioural therapy, you know, if you go have, have a psychologist and there's so many services available, like it, it certainly helped me and continues to do so.
Mm-hmm. And um, medication's an option too. Yeah, yeah, of you course. Talk to yeah. your doctor and find out what works for you. But mm. you know, you don't have to be. Some people are pro medication. Some people are pro natural. That it doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, you can find what works for you. And I think the important thing is that you have a doctor or a health care person mm. and don't that be you to understand that you like and you connect and you can talk and you've really got to tell them what's going on with you because mm. otherwise they won't be able to guess. Mm. And, and it's probably worth saying that some of those services are available actually online. So Beyond Blue have mm. some fantastic um, online resources. So for people who are living in the country who might have less access, um, those services are still there. Mm. Mm. I've just recently accepted that I do need some help. Mm. So today I went and saw a psychologist who was also a friend that I met through Canteen. And so I'm trying to deny that I was get, getting down mm. but, um, and the weather didn't have much help because I wasn't getting out of the way which is always a lift mm. and she opened my eyes to a few things that I am seeing in myself and so it's done me the world of good just to go and talk to her today so we're going to make some more appointments and yeah, do good. it. Fantastic. It's good just to get it out of it. Um, mm. even, I find it difficult to talk to my mum and dad about this because I don't like to get them upset. Yeah. And I can't spit out what I want to say. I'll have hard enough time as it is. Um, You're doing pretty well tonight. But, yeah. I could, um, I could go on a tangent here, but I won't. Um, maybe I should. Yeah, I go. go have a little time. Before, before, like before I got through, <laughs> I couldn't um, get two words to rhyme together, but I've been able to, since I've just looked at the big fella scene, I've had a hard time, and he's nobody to write poetry. That's the best way I can get things out sometimes. It's like, um, not the conventional poetry, I won't go into that detail, but uh, look, again, I'm stuck. Sometimes we write it down, which we can because I can never remember what the poem was about because my memory's shot. They often come to me when I'm out the surf. And to be able to spit out what I, as I said, what I want to say, it's stuck in here and just can't get it out of my mouth. If I write it down, sometimes I'll read it and think, well, that's good. And, um, so that might be one way that uh, if you can find the resource to do it yourself, it might mm. help. Mm. But, but going and seeking some support and help and maybe going and see a, you know, a counsellor, a psychologist or, or if you're you know, in a rural remote area, is, you know, get online and seek some help because there's so many telephone counsellors available mm-hmm. now too Absolutely. that can help you. So good on you, Brett. That's a, like yeah, as I said, seeing the today. psychologist today is Give yep. a chance yeah, to get that out. That's great. And more, all the more opportunity in the future to get more out each time. Yeah. Big step. Yeah. So that'll um, got to help. And hopefully, if you've got the resources yourselves out there, you can um, just talk to anybody that's willing to listen, basically. Yeah. Most definitely. And I guess that's one of the big... Because we talked about on the, that on the phone, didn't we, Sam, about just someone being there to listen. You don't necessarily want them to tell you what to do yeah. or anything, just to be able to talk. That's just good advice in general, I think, when you listen to somebody's problems. But um, yeah, exactly. most definitely, it's uh, it's nice to just be able to to unload from time to time and to have friends and family that you know you can trust to kind of just let you do that. Which is um, it's not everybody has that skill. This thing's hard. You know, it's really hard, and that's that's okay. And it might take you a while to find that that friend or family member that you can unload on when you need to. But I think that's it's very important to you know just to feel like you're being heard. I mean, that's. Mm. What matters more than anything mm. when you're particularly, you know, frustrated with yourself or your situation. Yeah. Please don't get me wrong. I've got the best family I could ever ask for. Yeah. They are willing I know, but to like you in. said, you don't always want to. You don't want to yeah, upset them. It's just hard sometimes. Most yeah. definitely. Yeah. And yeah. Dealing with their own things. So you know, the experience happens to families, not just to the patient who's sick. Sometimes I feel guilty myself that I've done all this to them in the past, but mm. and so. Uh, yeah. Well, that's normal. I took that step and went and saw. Um, the psychologist today and just open the door a little bit wide and I'll get next time to get it further and it's put good. the chalk in there and get it further again. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I'm sure you'll find it very helpful. I think so. Yeah. So I might shoot through to the next question. Um, so what would each of the presenters like to have been told about when they had their last treatment? So something, is that those unexpected things that you don't really know how you're going to feel once you've had that last treatment and you wave goodbye like you said Yvonne you ring the bell and you, all that sort of thing it's like what's the last bit of advice I guess <laughs> don't do that that's hard <laughs> it is pretty tough in the time what would each of the presenters 
How did you feel when you had to ring the bell? You know, when you did that, did it? Oh, look, it, it felt good because radiation's every day. You know, I was sick of being there every day. Mm. But I was also aware that that wasn't it for me. I was still having Herceptin. I was still, you know, ha had some... Um, Herceptin, if you don't know, is a targeted breast cancer treatment and it's an infusion that I was having every three weeks for a year. So I still had other stuff going on. So mm. I, I was happy to ring the bell and say it's the end of this bit, but yeah. I had more Get stuff on to the next. going on. But, I, I mean, I'm... Um, I'm quite lucky in the sense that I have a lot of resources that are still available to me. I have a wonderful breast care nurse who still picks up the phone when I call. So I didn't sort of have that experience where treatment was finished and I got waved goodbye to. I still have follow-up, I still have backup, I still have support. So, so I, I didn't really, I can't really say that, you know, there's something I'd like to be told at the end because mine is more of a continuing journey. Mm. And that's that's um, like uh, I'm unbelievably lucky to have to have that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are there are resources if you don't have a breast care nurse attached to your hospital. There there are online ones, and I think there there are ways that you can have that support. Um, but I didn't sort of have that end point. Really. Yeah, I guess. I was very fortunate. I was able to keep my sense of humour. Also, when I was cook, but I say. A lot of people say they have a journey with cancer. I have to say mine is an adventure with cancer. Mm -hmm. And now it's like a trial going from my adventure into the forward. Some, um, mm. So if that makes any sense, I don't know. Mm. Sorry. I think um, at the end of it, because I did have that kind of moment when my treatment finished. I spent four days in bed after because it was a particularly rough regimen. Um, I think maybe, you know, on my first checkup back, having somebody tell me, like, it's okay to feel overwhelmed, you know, it's okay to feel tired and it's okay to just say no to things, you know, from here on in, you know, if you're just feeling a bit, I guess, in a funky mood, you know, something like that. Yeah, just, it's okay. Like, you're okay and it's okay not to be okay. Yeah. Something like that. Something pretty simple, calming, and, yeah, that would have been lovely. But, um, you just, I was so exhausted. Like, I don't even really remember the last, like, the four days after I finished. I remember the two weeks after the four days getting slowly getting better and regaining my strength. But, yeah, I mean, I, I don't even remember, mm. really. You know, chemo grain or whatever you'd like to call it. But, yeah, as soon as I finished, I went home and just, yeah, it's kind of a blank from, you know, I finished my last chemotherapy on a Wednesday until about Sunday. I couldn't even tell you what I did. Mm. Mm. So, so it's sort of being given permission to... To maybe be, feel like that, to not remember anything. Be kind to yourself and... Yeah, be kind to yourself is, is, is probably the best, you know, and don't, don't feel too bad if you're not as well, um, mm -hmm. especially being a younger person. That's, that's a pretty big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to, it can be hard to keep up sometimes. There's a lot of pressure to be okay afterwards. Yeah, there is. There's a, lo there's a lot of pressure because people think that, you know, survivorship or what, what comes next has got to be easier than chemo and radio and you've done all that. So, you know, you've done the hard bit. Mm. It's all the hard bit. Yeah. You know, it's all hard <laughs> and it's yeah, hard forever. And then you meet all these people, you know, because you've had cancer, you get messages out of the blue. Hey, Sam, my friend just got diagnosed with Hodgkin's or my friend just got diagnosed with a rhabdos myosarcoma. What can I do? Like, you know, this is the yeah. reason why we're doing this today. So, you know, it never really ends because you're always involved with somebody else's experience, I suppose. Oh, as long as you, you know, choose to involve yourself in that, yeah. which I think most of us probably do yeah. and will. Yeah. So I think, Sanchi, maybe back to the nursing days, what, yeah. what kind of advice would you give? Well, I, I mean, one of the things that people used to find very difficult is uh, actually leaving that intensive monitoring, so yeah. feeling a bit like you've been let adrift. And I, I think Yvonne's made the point that just having a phone number that you can ring um, and contact, and of course from a Cancer Council perspective, the 13 11 20 number is there that, people, that anyone can call. Mm. It's available for all people. But sometimes you also want that connection back that what because what people are often seeking is a sense that what they're experiencing is normal and that other people have experienced that as well so part of the um, preparation for end of uh, treatment I think is really thinking about what's the plan after that people would like to have something that's set out about when they're going to be seen again uh, what 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 that pathway looks like uh, the, the other thing from the days when I was in clinical practice and then through research to now that's different uh, is I think there is more attention being paid 
to the rehabilitation aspects of yeah. returning to normal. So Sam's talked about fatigue. I mean, there are some things that you can do now in terms of building up exercise capability and really working on um, getting back to being physically healthy again because treatment does take it out of you mm. uh, and really paying attention to the, those broader lifestyle factors that uh, are part of our whole prevention message but become just as important after a cancer diagnosis. Exactly. So, so certainly, you know, things like avoid, I, I think it's really tr tricky for kids that um, have been diagnosed with cancer. There's been a lot of issues around um, you know, taking up smoking and being a bit more risky um, in their behaviour. like you said. <laughs> <laughs> but re <laughs> recognising that actually, while those things are really important for somebody who hasn't had cancer, they're actually yeah. um, even more important for somebody who has in terms of um, increasing your risks. So, mm. um, on, do you mind if I interject? <laughs> you so, may, Sam. On, on that note, I will say, like, I think some people go kind of one or two or there's three ways to go after you finish cancer some people say oh my god i value my life so much i'm going to be healthy i'm going to run every day blah 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 blah. some people go completely the opposite like i can quite literally die any second so they get a little bit wild i i kind of have gone down the middle path a bit of both but um unfortunately you know i do do a lot of those being young and you know um having a lot of friends that smoke or drink or do other things like i, I do a lot of those things you know and i know i shouldn't and i'm like highly at risk but I struggle with that every day because I know how bad it is for me and I've already been through this thing once. But it's mm. kind of like that, and you know, you only live once kind of thing and I've been pretty scared already so I just make these silly decisions. But and that's, I struggle with that quite often. And I mm. can remember yeah. having this conversation with a girlfriend who had breast cancer and, uh, you know, our usual habit was to kind of sit down and have a glass of wine and have a bit of a chat. Mm. And so we... We actually decided that the best thing for us to do was not to do that, but to go for a walk around the block and um, and talk. And we played tennis together and those kinds of things. So that actually finding ways that your friends actually can engage with you in the sort of uh, rehabilitation and mm. plan for a healthy life that uh, really helps you regain mm. your strength. Mm. And so does that mean you need your friends to encourage you to be healthy and make good decisions? Not really. I'm responsible <laughs> for my own decisions. You know, I, I, you know, go into everything that I do knowingly. I just wake up maybe the next morning and feel a bit bad about it from time to time. But it's, mm. um, you know, I wouldn't put my health on anybody else because it's nobody else's responsibility. It's just hard, you know, being who I am, being having the friends that I do. It's, you know, it's been a, been a juggle and I'm still trying to get to the point where I'm, you know, healthy 75% of the time and only unhealthy 25% and then lower it good. and lower <laughs> it. Yeah. I'm still kind of about 60-40 right now, but, yeah. um, you know, it's something that you work on every day. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Thanks for sharing that. It's all right. Yeah. Um, so, I quite like this question. We had, we had a few good questions come up and it was a bit hard to pick out the best ones to put up here today but we can talk about more I'm sure we'll have some time so how can I create time and space for a person to feel cancer free so what do you think about that how does that I still dwell on it even though it was 28 years that um, the tumors have been gone often like you're saying if we get a lot of headaches in succession I'll start to worry and I had a melon lamb I cut out a couple of years ago now and skin cancer is a costly Constantly, constantly being burned off, and it's mainly the headache factor. And just if I have a, a fit, I think oh, here we go again. It's, it's always in the back of my mind. And like you're saying, people say forget it, it's over and done with. But it. it's all stuck in the back of my mind. Mm. So where's your where's your space? I think maybe surfing. That's my is that, outlet. Is that a but, um, a space that you can go to where you makes you feel can do you feel cancer free when you're out in the water? Or? Um, it's, it's like, some people meditate. Um, some people do other things. I just like to sit in the water. Or if there's no surf, I like to just go for a paddle and with my own thoughts and mm. um, sort of like I suppose um, standing in front of a car wash, getting everything blasted off me. Mm. And quite often I'll come home with more sand and. Worth shooting than I did when I left. Mm -hmm. so more often than not, I get belted on the shore break, but it's all mm. part of the therapy, I suppose. You could call it therapy. Mm. And, okay, um, 
Without fail, just one more, I'll go out with the attitude of one good wave and I'm happy and any more is a bonus. <laughs> and even just feeling the salt water on the skin's good. Mm -hmm. Right on. What was the original question, sorry? So it's just looking, you know, um, and this is a question of someone that's supporting somebody, you know, how can I create time and space for a person to feel cancer free? So it's like with your friends actually going and playing tennis and going for a walk and whether doing that normal made her, things. just doing normal things. Um, I think sometimes when I, because I have to wear a crash helmet and a pair of goggles that are made for the, the surf and riding a knee bottle, wear like what's all web gloves and flippers, so I thought it looked like an outcast to start with. But I see myself as an elitist. <laughs> <laughs> Not many of us left, so we're the elite. Do you know, I wear a compression garment for my lymphedema and I tell people I'm an elite athlete. So. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. But I think, I think one of the things that makes me feel cancer free. Um, is the lymphedema is a, is a, it's a big it's a big deal, um, and my friends know about it. So if I meet pe new people, I like to tell them about it because I don't like the questions. You know, especially in summer, aren't you hot and that, or what have you done to your arm, or this that and the other. So I feel that by people knowing that I've got some issues, it actually helps me deal with the issues because I don't have to explain it and explain it and educate mm. people and all that. So I think having friends that know and understand is fantastic. Mm. So then it doesn't have to be an issue. Mm. Mm. Well, sometimes mm. people have asked me why the crash helmet, and I'm proud to say I've got holes in my head, um, from the with brain, um, brain surgeons and stuff, but that's I think that helps people understand and admire that you still want to get out there and do it. Because mm. mm. yeah. mm -hmm. I, I can't surf anyway. <laughs> yeah, me either. Yeah. Mm. Um, so how can I create time and space? Uh, if you're somebody, for me, come sit down on the couch and watch cartoons with me. I don't want to talk to you. Just sit there and like, um, that's kind of my anxiety release. That or kind of playing video games, I suppose, is my little escape from reality. And I like, you know... Weirdly enough, doing that in company, but not really having to interact. I mean, and in saying that, like, that's my own personal thing. That's what I like to do. Um, you know, just something as simple as watching television. But I think if you're trying to create time and space for a person to feel cancer-free, find out what their thing is that they do for themselves and do it with them. And if mm. that means doing it with them kind of alone together kind of thing, then do that. Or if it is something that you can both do together, then do that. Obviously, you know, just, just ask. Ask what they do to try and, like get out of their head or get out of their illness for a little while and just kind of mm. be supportive in that um, would be my, would be the best mm. advice I could possibly give. Yeah. Mm. Mm. It's good. The problem my best friend, is, her name's Kim, and she was, um, had leukaemia when she was young. Right. And we um, often, well, good hearted banter, that always gives us a bit of a boost either way, too, so it sort of works both ways at the same time. Mm. Because Kim has been through all the drama associated with and so she effect. understands. Yeah. Mm. It really helps having someone who's been through it to talk yeah, to. Yeah, we've, we've all seen it. It really, really helps because mm. they get it. Yeah. yeah. And that's, I guess, people that haven't, yeah. that want to do something, that's where they struggle. Mm. Yeah. Of like, you know, I, how can I really understand because I haven't been through this, but I still want to... It's enough to just do say, something, you know, I, I think I understand a bit of what you're going through. You know, just, just that willingness to sort of be there and not offer advice and not... And sometimes it's okay to say, mm. that really sucks. Do yeah. you know what I mean? You want, you want someone who can actually sit there and go, this isn't great. You don't want someone who's going to say, oh, you've got to be positive, you've got to yeah. be positive. You'll be right. <laughs> You'll be right. You're lucky. Because some days we don't feel lucky. Most days we do, but some days we don't. And it's really hard having mm. a, that yeah. extra pressure to be positive. That lucky thing. That lucky. It was a pain. Because <laughs> oh, I, I you know, Hodgkin's lymphoma, and you know, they were saying, oh, you're so lucky it's only Hodgkin's. Like, yeah, because it's, you know, 90% or oh, give or take cure rate, but it's just like, I still got cancer, that ain't lucky. There's nothing <laughs> lucky about that. That's, you know, a pet, that was definitely another pet hate. Yeah, yeah. so don't say. <laughs> You're so You're lucky so you lucky. got lucky. cancer. You, you got, got a, a good a cancer. cancer. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, that's or often with breast cancer. Yes. Mm. It's yeah. a bit of a... Yeah, yeah. And the other thing that I get, which you wouldn't believe it, but... I, if you have a breast reconstruction, oh, you're so lucky you get to pick the boobs you want. It's like, really? Not yeah, Come here and tell me I'm lucky. Have, you, have people yeah. actually said that? Yeah. That's yeah. outrageous. Yeah. And it's not quite, quite that easy, people. right? Yeah. 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 Never quite the same. No. no. Yeah. So, um, 
This is that one. It's kind of, we've kind of discussed this one, I guess, some advice on how to respond when people tell you it's time to move on, get over it. I don't know if anyone would be I, um, so nasty to say that, <laughs> but I guess some people do. I, my first thought would be, who, who's, who's saying that to you? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Who, who is saying that to you? Because, I mean, I've talked to a lot of people when I was doing the book and just through my own experiences, and I think, I don't know about you guys, but I think the people I've talked to, we've all universally felt let down by a friend at some point. Most definitely. Yeah. So whether they're, they're not understanding or they weren't there for you or they disappeared, you know, some, some friendships don't work through this. And I think if you have a friend who, who sort of tells you it's time to move on and get on with it, you've got to sort of work out if this is a friendship that you want to pursue. And if it is, and, you know, most of them should be because they're your friends, then I think you need to sit down and have a talk and explain to them exactly what it is that you're going through and exactly what your issues are and exactly why you can't move on. And I, I would hope they weren't as you know, lacking compassion to say get over it. Mm. But I think it might be hard for people to understand because, you know, there is this, this feeling that you're lucky and you've got over it, so why are you still moping? Mm. Yeah. But if, if you can sit down and talk to them and, and explain what's going on, I, I think you'll find that they'll be a little bit more empathetic and if they're not, if they're not a close friend, move on. Yeah, tell them to brush on. Just brush on. Springs yeah. to move on. Do you know what I mean? If, if they're not, if they're not a close friend, they've got no business saying that to mm. you. Mm. Um, Lin Linda was just saying on the chat. I was told that recently. I was told that recently, and it really surprised me who said it. Look, you. Which, Going, it's interesting. You are going to, everybody says, and I didn't believe them when they, somebody told me, I couldn't remember, it was a really great piece of advice actually. You are going to find out who your friends are, and you definitely do. I mean, I had, like, I quite literally had just people coming out of the woodwork saying, hey, mate, like, what can I do? And I was just like, dude, I haven't talked to you in two years. Yeah, I know, but we're, you know, friends, you're sick. And then I had people who I was very close to, not many, mind you, that just could not handle it all. And then I had, that, had to have that conversation with them at the end. You know, like, number one, you let me down. Number two, like, now I'm over it. I'm not just over it. Like, you, this is, this is not right, you know, and, you know, ended up losing a couple of friendships because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to... It's crazy what mm. like people who you were really close to what they what they say to you, mm. and then um, it I think hurts. You, can, you think you can save friendships as well. You can. I think you yeah. can save you friendships, can. but mm. I think you need to have that dialogue because mm. Mm. how would they know? You know. You have to assess whether it's worth saving as well. That's the big yes. one. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and the last thing I want anyone to do is sort of be in a position where they feel let down by their friends, but they're not either moving on or talking to their friends. They're just sitting there and taking on that, you know the distress of, of that situation. Mm -hmm. So I think you need to... It must to be hard sometimes. It is hard. It yeah. is really hard because you're feeling terrible and you feel like they should be there for you. And yeah. if they're not there, then... But it's very easy when you're, when you're feeling down and you're struggling with treatment to think, you know, why aren't they here for me? What have I done? But it's not, it's not about you. It's about them and their inability to cope with the situation. Without doubt. Yeah. It yeah. is not you. Mm. It's, it's amazing because you... <clears throat> Sanchi, I guess I've heard this lots of times. You would have heard... Mm -hmm the same thing about this friendship. Yeah, and, and I think the other thing that happens um, through the treatment is often you lose the, the reciprocity that's part of normal relationships, that sort of give and take, and so often if people have been there, um, it's been, the, the patient sometimes feels that they've got to, um, the, the accepting help's difficult. Yeah. But everybody you talk to has lost a friend or other um, mm. and gained it's one bizarre. that they partner universal sometimes, that experience marriage is. partners, mm. yeah, marriages, other things. And, and I, I'm with Yvonne that, it, that keeping the dialogue open and being mm. uh, one of the things that lots of patients have said is that they actually learn, they have to actually learn to speak out and to uh, be a bit more uh, proactive even if it's not their natural tendency and say mm. when something's upsetting them or it does start to eat away. Right? Yeah. It, mm. And that, that's one challenge. of the good things that you come out with is being a bit more assertive about, about your needs and about self-care and things like that. That mm -hmm. can be one of the positives. Do you feel like you're more assertive than you were before? I've always been a bit assertive. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the also, I don't want you to speak in the ear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and um, as we said in the, in the questions, which I forgot to say, we do, again, we get a lot of medical, specific medical questions which we can't really answer here. You need to go and see your treating professional. Um, to talk to about those questions. But as we said before, uh, we had a lot of questions about the fear of recurrence and um, whether we want to talk about that a little bit more and how to cope with it and how to seek support by people around you around this subject because it is a big, big
big subject, I think. One. And um, Annie was making, or somebody was making the point online that there is a, uh, has been a specific webinar on that topic that's yes, available we did. on the website. In fact, our very first webinar was the it's fear of recurrence. So it's so still there, and it's people... still there, and you can still access it online. Yeah, yeah, and it's a it's a really good one, but it's a subject that keeps coming up. Yeah, yeah. and it, but it links to the question about anxiety is that yes. recognizing that most patients feel some experience fearing of recurrence in some way or other that it's a completely normal feeling. It's developing the strategies. Um, to help you manage that and mm. uh, understanding the triggers and, and learning some techniques. Mm. So seeing a psychologist or uh, yeah. somebody who can really help you develop that. If it become, particularly if you see it becoming um, a, an interfering with your ability to live the life that you want to live. Mm. Mm, definitely. Well, that's great. So I don't have any more questions because we're nearly, we've got one minute to go. One minute to go. Oh, so yeah. who's got something burning they want to say? <laughs> Hang in there. Hang in there. It's not the end. If you can keep yeah. a sense of humour and laugh at yourself regardless of um, how you look, I'll tell you what, that's what kept me alive. Sense yeah. of humour. Dad would come in and visit because he was working in town, I was at RPA, okay. he'd come in and visit and put his fingers up my nose if I was asleep or in the ears. <laughs> Um, Too much information, Brent. No, oh, sorry about that. But, um, <laughs> as I said, I'm proud of the, so I'm bald, I was proud of being bald, and um, I needed help. But I could stand up still. I, you know, mm. I won't go into that sort of thing. But um, just basically, what I'm trying to say is try to keep a light-hearted approach. I know it's hard for, to do. Yeah. And again, I was very lucky with the. The nurses, I salute every nurse on this planet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do a well, great job. Amazing job. job. <laughs> Amazing job. They became great friends. But, um, yeah. And um, so I'll start again now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just do the best you can. Yeah. That, uh, that's not very good. No, no that's good. Not that's, very heartening. That's, it is heartening. <laughs> Are you gone? Uh, I'm, sorry, gone. I'm finished. always about taking the help. I think, you know, you said it's hard to take help, but there's so much help out there. And it doesn't have to be this way or that way. You'll find what works for you. But th there are lots of resources, whether it's a person or an organisation or a doctor or a nurse. But, but you know, don't, don't suffer in silence. If something's not working for you, if you're really struggling with something, there, there are people that, that it's their job to help you and there are people that want to help you. So take it, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It gets better. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Parting words, Sandra? No, I think we'll leave them with you on there. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. So, again, Cancer Council 13, 11, 20 for information and support. So that's Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. You can ring with any question or query. Um, the ladies and men that are on the end of the um, telephone there know most things and can point you in the right direction to get some help for whatever it is you might need. Um, and again, if there's anything that's come up for you tonight, you'd lead, like to talk to somebody tonight, you've got Lifeline 13, 11, 14. So when we sign off, and I often forget to say this, we have a survey which we would love you to do, which helps us to develop our webinars going forward. So if you've just got, it takes a couple of minutes, we don't ask many questions, um, please fill it out. And um, next webinar is about anxiety and depression, funnily enough, so we'd love you to come and watch that one. It'll be a, another good one. Um, but thank you to the panel. Thank you, Sanchia, for coming on board My and pleasure. helping with all the information that um, has been hopefully useful to you all. And Yvonne, Brett, Sam, thank you so much. Thank you, Jo. It's been thank great. Thanks for having us here. Thank you. Yeah. That's yes. all right. So good night, everyone. Have a good night, and we'll see you next time. Cheers to all champions. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>